today we're going back in time. Picture it, it's the year 2010. jQuery just came out with its brand new version 1.4 and the web is hard, very, very hard to do right. jQuery made some things better by normalizing different browsers' behaviors, but things were still hard to make a web application on the web until 2010 when an amazing new piece of technology came out called Backbone JS. Today, I'm doing a little bit of a history tour back when Backbone JS was the new hotness over 10 years ago. It's 2021 when I'm recording this. This is 2010 when Backbone first came out. And when Backbone JS came out, it was a huge deal. So if you're curious why Backbone JS was such a huge deal and why it's important to give context on where we are today by looking at the history and the past, well, this episode of my channel is for you. So put on your history hat and let's go back in time. So before I can really explain why Backbone JS was so revolutionary for its time, I need to kind of set the stage to what web development was like in 2010. Uh, 2010, the current hotness, which was kind of old at that point. I mean, if you look at the uh, old version of jQuery, it first came out in 2006. Backbone came out in uh, 2010. So at that point, jQuery was, you know, getting super old, four years old, <laughs> JavaScript. But the big way that you wrote applications in jQuery, which kind of resulted in people calling it jQuery soup, Soup's kind of thrown out with anything that people don't like, which I don't know why, because soup is delicious. Um, the way that you made applications with jQuery is uh, through an imperative application way, where you kind of just explicitly tell the program what you want to happen. So for example, if you want to change the content of a web page, you say, find this content on the page, this button with the continue class, and set the contents to next step, fine. If you want to do an event handler, you'd say, you know, find the ID of button container and then a child of button. And then when there's a click event, run this handler. And this is a, this is how the browser works by and large. The on handler was an abstraction on the built-in browser uh, add event listener, and it made it kind of fine for every application. But this was the way that you wrote applications with jQuery. You just kind of have these lines and you try to you have your JavaScript file over here. You say, reach out into the HTML, find the element, attach this listener. When this listener happens, then take this behavior. And that's compared to what React does, which is declarative, where you kind of just describe your UI and you say that when this button's clicked to run this handler. And you, as a developer, don't need to care at all how that event listener is actually added to the web page. That's why React was so revolutionary when it first came out, because this is just happening by magic. You can change what's in here, and, and React will happily change that for you. If you want to change something in jQuery, you have to first call off to make sure you don't leak an event listener, and then add a new one. It's all this very imperative hand-holding to make sure that it behaves as you want. Which brings us to Backbone. Backbone was the first JavaScript framework that gave structure to web applications. And it did that with a truly innovative piece of technology called Model View Controller. Uh, Model View Controller, uh, I have a tab over here, is actually a very old software design pattern that's been around for desktop GUIs for a long time. However, it was not until Backbone.js that it existed on the web. Up until Backbone.js, and I'm sure I might be wrong, but this is my experience, and I'm sure it's the right one, because it's my experience. Until Backbone.js came out, MVC was not really a thing on the web. All you already had was jQuery and imperative coding. And the whole thing with MVC, so you had some model, which held the state of your data. When the model updated, you kind of have a view of what the UI would be, which the user would see, and then a user can interact with the view, 
which will go through the controller to kind of handle the interactions between the user and the data. And then you'd update the model, which would have this nice little loop of feedback. And that's what Backbone did. It brought that whole idea of MVC directly to the browser, which was honestly, truly groundbreaking at the time. This is perhaps a clearer view of what Backbone did. You have user input to the view, which is your UI, which goes to the model, which you can go to the database to sync. The model emits change events, which then updates the view, which the user can then interact with, yada, 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 ad infinitum. And the way you kind of write that is with these objects. Uh, the funny thing about Backbone.js is it kind of feels more like Java than JavaScript, especially with React and other Vue.js modern JavaScript frameworks. You have here an example of making a Backbone model, which you'd extend from the base class. You'd have some arbitrary methods to attach to it. And then you can actually add events, arbitrary events onto the sidebar. This is saying that when the color attribute in the model, an attribute being just part of the model changes, emit this callback. So when you call set to change the color white, it'll actually emit this. When you change the color, it'll call this event listener to actually change the background of the sidebar to the color that you set. So in this way, you have this coupling where the data of your application is now being taken out of the DOM and into your JavaScript. And that was kind of the big change with Backbone from jQuery. With jQuery, all your data was in the DOM attached to these DOM nodes. It was very common in jQuery land to get a reference to a DOM node and then just attach arbitrary information to it. Um, one of the most powerful features of jQuery was its data operator, where you could just attach data to store arbitrary data that's associated with a specified element and or get that value. So for example, if you want to change the sidebar color, you'd save that as a data, data element on an element. So every time that you wanted to see what the state was, you have to check the DOM and go back from there, which is actually very slow and expensive to check the DOM every time. Whereas with Backbone, you just keep all that state in JavaScript, such that when you interact with the UI, it goes to the model and that's the source of truth. That's the big thing. Where is your source of truth? And Backbone took it from the DOM into JavaScript. And kind of the rest is history with Angular, React, Vue, all these other modern frameworks building off of that initial huge um, paradigm shift. So the question becomes, how did Backbone.js do MVC? Like, how does it actually look to make a Backbone application? Uh, funnily enough, you have models, uh, collections, which are collections of models. Uh, you have views, and then views kind of work as a controller as well, kind of conflated the controller and view inside of, uh, inside of a Backbone view. But also the things that were unique with Backbone is it kind of came with the fundamentals for what you need for any modern JS application. It had a events module, which kind of, it's just a pub sub module that essentially every other part of Backbone extended from. So essentially anything could be a pub sub. You had model, which had just basic ways to make Backbone models. You can just have default values, methods that, you know, kind of like Java, just big Java objects. Um, funnily enough, actually, Backbone is actually derived from a Rails application. So maybe not so much it's patterned after Java as it is after Rails, but again, just OO in general. So. It was a Rails application that was extracted. The best things are always extracted from real applications because you kind of get to tease out all the edge cases and make a very strong inner core. And the fact that Backbone is still around in some applications since 2010 is a testament to that. You have models, you have collections, you have a router for um, client-side routing. I distinctly remember the day when uh, Backbone started implementing the history API such that the hash fragments that most Backbone applications use could actually use fancy history API methods. And I actually remember when that happened because I was like, oh my gosh, can we do this yet? Is this possible? Uh, revolutionary at the time. I'm old. Um, but you have here a map of routes to methods to call when those routes were called. Uh, history, which is an implementation detail to kind of wrap the history API or the hash API. Uh, sync, this is kind of a 
way to look at it as like Axios or uh, React Query, a way to kind of bridge models to the server to make sure that these are in sync. Because this is extracted from a Rails application, it assumed that things were very restful. So it actually had um, pretty opinionated ways of doing syncing with CRUD of create, read, update, delete. And it would map, the default sync handler maps CRUD to rest like so. So when you had these methods, it expected these endpoints to exist, which is how Rails behaves. So no surprise there. And then view. Oh, actually, before I get to view, another big part of Backbone was its way of using underscore. So the author of Backbone.js was also, was, is also the author of underscore JS. And if you're not aware of underscore JS, it is essentially the uh, prototype before um, Lodash was a thing. It's a utility belt with lots of common methods. And the thing that was great about underscore and backbone is they work together in that backbone mixed in underscore methods onto its models. So all these nice little utilities calling keys was just available on backbone models as a nice convenience. So that made it very powerful to use. And those were nicely, strongly coupled together. And one of my favorite things about backbone is how small it is. Uh, you can actually, it's all one source file. And if you had an afternoon, an hour or two, uh, how many lines of code is it? Is it? It's just over 2,000 lines of code with all of these things in it. Uh, you could spend an afternoon and happily read through all this code and actually understand internally how Backbone works. That was back in the day when things were small enough and simple enough that my little mind could understand. But if you want a little exercise of reading some code, this is a great example of it. So Backbone was great. NBC was awesome. Things were terrific, except for one huge Achilles heel that Backbone had. So I'm talking about models and events and all these things, but I haven't talked about the view yet. And that is because when Backbone got to the view layer of your application, it kind of said it was your problem. <laughs> it really punted that responsibility off of the shoulders onto the developers. And that's where things started to kind of fall apart. Uh, as he even says in the docs and like Backbone does not shy away from this. It is happily, um, not ignorant, but uh, unopinionated for what you do with the view uh, by saying in its doc that Backbone views are almost more convention than they are code. Ouch. Um, you have a backbone view, which is, you know, you have a tag name for the view, like the DOM element, the class name, and you have, you know, initialized so that you could, when the model changes, when, so listen to the backbone model, and when it emits a change event for anything, then call this render. And this render, of course, makes you think about React, Angular, all those other things. And if you actually go to render, and you see what it looks like, <laughs> the default implementation of render is a no op. By default, backbone views render method does nothing. Okay, uh, it suggests that you can use um, the template method from underscore, which is, but also you can use mustache.js or handlebars. So if you use mustache.js in the past, you know that it's a nice little templating language in JavaScript where it's um, mostly logicless. I still don't really believe that it's logicless, but it has these nice little curly braces that I'm sure you've seen elsewhere in your travels. And essentially what Backbone recommends you do is that when the model changes, you compile your template. So all the content in here, and then you just re-render it onto your DOM element and you just replace all that content with new content. And that sucks for some really important reasons. One, it can be incredibly expensive because rather than React or other applicate frameworks where it will discreetly make changes onto the DOM to make sure that things are optimized and efficient, Backbone just says, screw it, replace the entire thing. And one of the examples that I love to point to, which I find to be the most irksome, is with input elements. So I'm gonna grab the sidebar which is as a jQuery element, which is this entire thing over here. 
and I actually have some code here. So I'm just going to replace all that with just an input element here. So let's say you have a form with backbone.js and you want to do la 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 and like as people update the form, you want to like, you know, grab that content and when the content changes, you want to make an API call and update the content in here. You want to re-render the page inside of that. So you get the content back. You want to like, you know, add some more things. You want to do an H1 now. You say, hooray. And then when you re-render this, notice how I have my content, my text in here. But when I re-render it and I replace the entire HTML content, where did my input text go? It's gone because I've replaced all of those DOM nodes with new ones, which means that if I want to discreetly make changes to my DOM with Backbone.js, I'm doing a lot of custom work inside of here to get different parts of my DOM and then changing it to make sure that things are persisted on the screen. And all of a sudden I'm back in imperative land where I'm grabbing things discreetly and making sure that the only things I want changed are changed back in jQuery land. And that sucks. And that's honestly one of the big reasons why the next big framework after backbone.js was angular and angular was incredible because it could make these discrete changes on your behalf in a mostly declarative manner. And then of course react came out and then just took that even further and made things even more efficient and more bare bones. What cracks me up about React is that it is essentially only the view layer. I mean, it says that on the page, and it does not care one lick about your backbone or collection, about your models or collections. It is the V in MVC uh, proudly as well. And that's kind of, I think, the fatal flaw of backbone and why th things, why it has not really uh, kept itself in the limelight because of that. If it had solved the view layer, things might have been a different story. So that is the triumphant tale and sad downfall of Backbone.js, a framework that I really cut my teeth in when I was first in the industry in 2010. 2010 was when I got my first professional job and I saw that shift from jQuery to Backbone. I myself was just amazed by this whole paradigm shift of a different way of doing things. Um, and it's just been a wild time just seeing things progress from there. Uh, Backbone, I still have a fondness in my heart for it uh, because it was so influential in my early years as a web developer. But as with all things, progress moves forward and Backbone hasn't really kept up with the times. But in its heyday, it was the bee's knees. That's my video for this week. Hopefully you enjoyed that fun little jaunt through history. I always like creating a little bit nostalgic for you all. If you're not a subscriber, do become one, and I'll catch you in the next video. Stay happy, stay coded. Till then, I'll see ya.